Roll, roll, roll the weasel with E. Daily Mo. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Blow the Whistle with EJ Lee Law, where we are going through the 12 technical files that I see most often in the IP game. So just before we get started, we are going to do a recap with technical files one, two, and then obviously going into three. So let's start off with a little bit about EJ Lee Law. EJ Lee Law Practice LLC is located in Metro Atlanta. We handle copyright and trademark registrations worldwide, adding patents soon, as well as drafting, reviewing, and negotiating contracts for members of the entertainment industry and Georgia businesses, big and small. Yes, indeed. So we're gonna start off with a recap of what we talked about over the last two uh, technical files. We talked about technical file number one, what is the purpose of a trademark? If you want more information on that, you can go back to our uh, first technical file on that, the video. Technical file two, understanding the differences in IP. Um, we talked about the differences between patent, copyright, and trademark. And now we are going into our next technical file, which is technical file number three, slogans. Are you using them correctly? So um, I want you guys to start thinking about um, some of your favorite slogans. And I know one of them that will possibly come to mind for sure is Nike. So let's talk about it. What is a slogan? A slogan is a short and striking or memorable phrase used in advertising. So again, what are some of your favorite uh, slogans? And how how often do you see more than one slogan, slogan belonging to a company? So obviously again, one of the most famous slogans out there is the just do it for Nike. Um, but we're also gonna play a little game today where we're gonna look through some of these slogans. Uh, so why is this a technical file? This is a technical file just because a lot of times I will have clients that come to me with a ton of slogans or taglines that they want to use. And just like, again, the purpose of a trademark is to act as a source identifier, your slogan is supposed to do the exact same. So sometimes it takes a little more time for your slogan to gain that secondary meaning needed for it to be functioning as a source identifier. So you might not necessarily file for a trademark registration for a slogan until you've been using it for enough time to where you can present evidence to the USPTO that it has become a uh, second tagline or something that your clients, your customers are associating with you. And so that takes time versus the name that you use on your packaging. And so your evidence is going to be critical um, in showing that that slogan is in fact being associated with your company over time because you're consistently using it and you're making that association for between the two. So again, Nike has some of the, the strongest and we're gonna go through um, a list of other iconic slogans um, in a game that we're gonna play. And I wanna see how many of McKinsey knows off the top of her head and some that we didn't even know were associated with some of these top brands out here. All right, so that is technical file number three where we're talking about uh, slogans. And now it's time for what's happening in these IP streets with McKenzie. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. So IP streets. Yeah. What's IP happening in the streets? What well, are they saying? Oh wait, hold on, I got some client information. There we go. Take a look <laughs> out. Oh, <I> <laughs> got a whiteboard and everything now. Like, oh, ma'am. <laughs> I do have, um, I know we wanted to speak about Jaleel White. So I wanted to yes. say him. Yes. Yay. What is Mr. Jaleel doing? He is starting his own, or he's going into the cannabis industry as well. He said he decided to go into it due to more than 20 years of his character, his fictional TV character, being portrayed on cannabis products. So he partnered with 710 Labs wow. and released, um, started his his business actually today on 420 so oh yeah what? genius marketing or what Absolutely. now i, I want to reiterate who jaleel white is because clearly i'm old um so most people might not be familiar with family matters that show has been off the air for years now um and i unfortunately have to say this uh that show has not aged well what? in terms of if you watch the reruns but anyway family matters was a show that came out 
um, in the 90s, and it was a super popular show. And so one of the characters on that show was Steve Urkel. So right. I'm pretty sure even if you didn't watch that show as a kid, like I did, um, you're familiar with the Steve Ur Urkel character. And I, did I do that? And all of the key right. little lines that he had. And so what's interesting to me about this is I would really like to see the contract that Jaleel White had with ABC, because if I'm my understanding, ABC owns Family Matters, right? And so uh, Steve Urkel is a character from that show. And so, you know, one of the technical files that we talked about was the overlap between copyright and trademark. Um, so Steve Urkel is a character for the purposes of copyright of television series. And then also he could be seen as a trademark as well uh, for ABC. They could use him for marketing and other different things. I think they have done cross branding where he was on um, an episode of Full House. And so again, well, usually those characters belong to the, the uh, TV network. So obviously in this case, Jaleel White has gotten some kind of um, permission from ABC to be able to use this character for cannabis, you know? <laughs> well, this, this brand is called It's Purple. Okay. So not technically, I think, you know, it doesn't have the Urkel name. But he's dressing up as Steve Urkel. Have yeah. you seen it? I haven't. Okay, so there's an actual ad of him talking yes. to Snoop where he's dressed as the Steve Urkel character and okay. he's going through the different strands that he's releasing. So <laughs> clearly he's gotten some clearance from them to be able to use this character in this way. At least I assume he has. Right? Yeah, you know, I would, again, I I'd love that. to see that contract just to see what it says um, okay. in terms of him being able to do that. But that's awesome. Very smart branding. Um, I know there was talk about Jaleel White saying that he would rather have a bullet in his head than to play the Steve Urkel character again because he kind of got locked into it. Yeah, he didn't He didn't really do too much after that, but hopefully he gets yeah. syndication, so. Yeah, I think it's just another, um, I what the article I was reading about it was stating how he was saying, you know, being in the cannabis industry has been challenging, but very rewarding. Okay. That's what was very inter interesting, just as a minority, you know what I'm saying? And gotcha. in this field and this booming and, you know, new field essentially, so. I thought that was really interesting. And of course, you know, on 420 for the marketing, that's that's, that's pretty innovative. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do it on a day, do it on 420. Right. You know, I'm not mad at him. Now, I don't smoke. You know what I'm saying? I probably should because a lot of times I'm stressed the heck out. But, you know, I don't smoke, people. <laughs> so let me see. I do see that. Um, so NFTs, a lot of people are probably are becoming more... Um, uh, a lot of people are becoming more, I guess, normalized to when it things that. So Bitcoin is something that people are becoming more normalized with. Also, uh, Bitcoin, right? Blockchain technology, all of that information. So there's something called NFTs, which is another uh, form of blockchain technology that okay. I see that some companies are starting to uh, use. So basically, NFT is some sort of it's called a non fungible token. Okay. And what it is, is it's not something that's not duplicated. And once you have it and purchase it, um, there's permanent inscriptions of ownership records in this, whether it's a digital artwork, a digital mm -hmm. card, a digital coin, whatever it is. Right. Um, and so I saw Snoop Dogg was doing art with NFTs, which I thought was really, really interesting. Snoop Dogg and, gonna do everything, ain't he? We, this is gonna be a Snoop Dogg show. We just talked about him being in the end with yeah. Steve, or I'm sorry, Jaleel. <laughs> right, and uh, the NBA was doing it. There's actually someone who purchased uh, an NFT Top Shot moment from the NBA um, for two hundred and eight thousand dollars. Are you freaking serious? So he purchased this moment. Granted, it was a LeBron James dunk, but now wow. he has this moment, you know, with ownership records, which I thought would be really interesting when it comes to you know ownership. Mm -hmm. and legal rights and whatnot mm -hmm. see how you know that transfer of information is kept the records the legalities behind it and right. what so i thought that'd be something that we could speak about and kind of see how that works when it as so it i guess it's giving me the idea of kind of like what um the company that was working with little nas was trying to do they weren't treating mm -hmm. these pairs of shoes as mm -hmm. art so when you have a piece of it it becomes invaluable because you're not going to get any more of it 
So right. that's the same way I'm assuming that the NFT is supposed to work. It's a piece of art that no one else can get their hands on unless they buy it from you. So it becomes a property right that you can pass to your family for them to sell or it, ha it has some monetary value. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Super novel as well, because it's not, uh, like I said before, you can't duplicate it. You can't trade one for another. Like it's kind of like just one one of one. So, right. I thought so like trading cards, I, that's what something I read about the NFTs. It's like trading cards in that its value is in that it's only a limited number of them. Right. This is awesome. Okay. I like, I want to see where this goes. Yeah, me too. It's really interesting. And I almost wanted to say, you know, ush bucks could have been. <laughs> It could have been, you know, something. He that... should have done an NFT. Yeah. yeah <laughs> That's what he should have, instead of them Usher dollars. No, we don't want this. Um, I also, uh, I wanted your opinion on, there's this act that was passed. Um, I know it's it's mainly directed toward patents, but um, it's called the IDEA Act. It's okay. It's the Inventor Diversity for Economic Advancement Act of 2021. Okay. And so this act in specific is trying to close the gap when it comes to diversity uh, and inclusion when it comes to patents and applications. Hmm. So what I thought was interesting about it was that instead of people, you know, they were going to try to begin monitoring patent applications to see uh, a demographic type poll and more, you know, to see uh, the diversity, inclusion, you know, the, the different people who are applying for patents. But um, I saw some commentary on it that basically said instead of doing and, and implementing these programs, we should instead invest more in STEM, you know, when it comes to minority outreach. One thousand percent agree. And so I was wondering, like, when you do applications, when it comes to trademarks and stuff, do you think there is a uh, diversity or inclusion issue when it comes to you? We have been talking about this thing since... Um... I got into this space. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is most of the times um, there aren't enough minorities in STEM education or in STEM uh, fields. Like if I had known when I went to law school that I needed to have a science background to do patent, I would have made sure I had that background. I didn't know that was even a requirement. And, but what's interesting about uh, particularly patent law is that I can't do um, patent prosecutions with pre patent prosecution is what they call it, putting the applications through, but I can do patent litigation. So how does it make sense that I can't do the applications, which requires a level of understanding, right, from the science perspective, but I can do patent litigation? Like to me, that doesn't make sense. But to me, it's still like another flipped. barrier. Yeah, you think it'd be flipped. Like you, you would think it would be flipped exactly. Or if I can do, if I can't do the prosecution, which is the applications, then I shouldn't be able to do the litigation. It's right. as simple as that. I don't really understand what is the case, but it feels to me, um, and I, I'm sure people would disagree with me, but it feels like another barrier because in terms of becoming a lawyer, there was a time when there was not a bar exam. You, you studied other, under another lawyer. You were sort of an apprentice, you know, and so... Um, after the Civil War and after Black people started becoming more involved in, you know, becoming citizens and participating in careers and things like that, all of a sudden you had these tests that started coming in. You needed a college degree. And then, okay, so what colleges are are you getting to getting into if you're not being allowed into PWIs, which are pr uh, predominantly white institutions? Right. So there's always another barrier. So in addition to um, that I can't do patent prosecution, you have to sit for a, a separate bar from the bar exam. So it's like, every, every time I look around, there's another barrier. And so if you make it that much harder, of course, there's not gonna be a lot of patent black patent lawyers, number one. Number two, black people practicing patent or STEM related uh, fields, you know? So um, we need to make it less intimidating because the the thing about it is it's not so much that you can't do it. It's just a matter of learning it. So um, as I've said, EJ Lee Law is getting ready to go into patent soon. I am actually going back to school so that I can sit for the patent bar. So that is definitely happening starting in August. I will be taking my first science class. Bless my heart, Lord. Uh, I'm going to do chemistry. I actually liked chemistry when I was in high school. So um, 
I mean, it wasn't e easy then, but I, I, I don't want to let anything that's intimidating me stop me from doing that. You know what I'm saying? There's always someone trying to tell, oh, well, we're trying to make you feel scared or putting their fear onto you. But everything that we're doing is in spite of fear. Doing this YouTube channel is in spite of fear. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That <laughs> we're going to keep being consistent and telling you guys about things that you need to avoid so that when you're doing your trademark registrations, when you're doing your patent registrations, whatever it is, you're armed with knowledge so you can't say you didn't know okay but we're moving in spite of that's yes, right mm -hmm. but yes, yeah, I, just, I think you know there was one comment and after this you know i'll end my segment but it was it was this one comment that i don't know i just wanted your opinion on it basically this commentator said that this type this would result in lower quality patents issued to inventors in such favored groups so this idea act and you know basically beginning to monitor applications and trying to make sure diversity and, and inclusion are being you know readily you know regu not regulated but um surveyed essentially mm -hmm. that this commentator said that it would result in lower quality patents issues so it's almost like so you're trying yeah. to say if there's more i guess minorities involved we're going to have less quality patents is that what we're saying I mean, that's how I interpreted it, but I just wanted your opinion because it, I mean, this in specific was an article off of IP Watchdog. Okay. And um, so I want to say that what they are maybe hoping to mean is that increased, you know, surveying or whatever may take away from the, I don't know if there's a culture to applying for patents or patent. You don't even but. have to prove that a patent works to get a patent, uh, registration so what is he talking about you don't even have to prove it works it can be a theory right so we've got a lot of useless patents in fact there's a patent <laughs> person that i follow i love her to death she's not even a patent examining attorney she she just speaks on patents. she's been um studying this thing for a long time so one of the things that she focused on specifically is design patents so someone was just issued a design patent for a hot dog bun shaped like a dog house. Like for real. Like for real. So how is that helpful per se, if he wants to talk about uselessness or less quality? Why do you need a patent for that? Oh, so you don't want nobody else to make a, a, a hot dog shaped hot dog bun <laughs> or a dog, dog house shaped hot dog oh, bun, bun for seven <laughs> years? What would he freaking do? Yeah. Sir, goodbye. Whoever that is, they're a troll. You probably can't see their picture. Can you? Let me pull it back up. I'm just curious. Let's see. I see obviously the writer. I actually don't see the picture. Hold on. Let me you, <laughs> let me, no, I bet you don't have no picture. They never do. It's just interesting. I just, I don't like when people, I think just people are very resistant. Res change is hard, period. You know what I'm saying? Period. Especially if you are in a field where you're, uh dominated in or you know what i'm saying you know whenever it comes to the different gaps between women and men with mm -hmm. race, whatever the case may be so you know it just it sucks when somebody comes up with an idea you know the invention right. university for economic act <laughs> to um help basically not just bridge the gap to look for you know some sort of relief or you know some sort of cop out or handout but just to be able to even give people the opportunity to have access to the same things. I think the STEM, um, uh, investing in the STEM programs is obviously super huge when it comes to being minority um, or women, you know what I'm saying? Whichever the case may be. Because I know being a black woman in tech law is, is now, you know, is still an anomaly. You know, it's something that's yes, it, it is a very small percentage, which is why the USPTO has been conducting uh, symposiums trying to uh, bring more women on and to let them know there are opportunities, there are people out there willing to help them that have been doing this for a number of years right now. So they're not in a position where they have to worry about their careers, about reaching back at this point in their lives. And so I really like that the USPTO is doing that and encouraging people. And, you know, funny thing enough, I had reached out to one of my advisors when I was in law school because I had came to him before I graduated and told him what my, uh, my plan was, was that I wanted to go back to school. So it would have been much easier for me to have Done that and he discouraged me unfortunately and um 
at the end of the day, I recognize that a lot of times these people in academia are looking out for the school. They're not looking out for the students and understanding what their goals and dreams are. I don't care how, how hard it might seem it might be, but now this dream has still been with me all these years later. And so I know that sometimes you have to listen to your gut. You just need that one person to encourage you to do the things that you want to do in life. Hell, to even take the patent bar, you only need a C average. I can do a C. <laughs> I can do a C. You know, I wasn't going to take a whole bunch of classes, but I think about that often. You know, how many times have there been young ladies or uh, other minorities who just needed someone to believe in them and they were discouraged and went another route? How many right. people of inventors that were passing up with all kinds of inventions that could change the world? A black person created the traffic light. So what if someone discouraged them from being able to do that? Would we be bop, bumping into each other right about now? Right. You know, and again, you don't even have to prove that the patent works. You just need to put the idea out there to inspire somebody else to go after it. We're improving all the time. The whole point mm -hmm. is to encourage invention and innovation. You know, so I, I, why would you not? Why would you want to limit the amount, the number of people that are able to do that? I don't get right. it. It's crazy. But anywho, we're gonna get off our soapbox and we're gonna right. play a little game. Okay. All right. Okay. So I found an, uh, an article and it says 63 of the catchiest company slogans ever. So like this list has over 63. So we're only going to do a few of them because there's someone here I know for sure that you would get, but I just want to uh, go over a few of them and you tell me if you can guess the company. All right. Okay, don't give me too many hard ones. <laughs> okay. I won't give you too many hard ones. Okay. So I, I think you would recognize this one, but I forgot about it. So breakfast of champions. <laughs> see, see, see. I was uh, not <laughs> that belongs to Wheaties. Okay, okay, okay. I I should have known that one. Right. I, 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 I forgot one. that one. Okay. Um. Here's another one. I I know you should know this one. The best a man can get. I've heard it before. Okay. Hold on. Come on. Gillette. Gillette. Okay. Okay. Gillette. Okay. Okay. Now this one threw me off. I'm like, since when was that one of their taglines? Think different. That is so vague. Think different. I'm just gonna tell you, it belongs to Apple. I would have guessed that. I would have never guessed that. So I don't know how they're using it or where they're using it, but it, it can't be cont continuous and consistent. So it might've been something they were using a while ago and maybe let go of. Hmm. So I, I never heard of that one. Here's another one. I'm sure you know this one. I'm loving it. McDonald's. <laughs> so I don't know Wheaties, but I know McDonald's. <laughs> you know McDonald's, don't you? <laughs> oh, here's a good one. Like a good neighbor. Stay Farm is there. Question. Yeah, what happened to the ba da ba ba ba? I'm loving it. Or no, we love to see you smile. That was. Uh, I think this one. That one is actually on here for McDonald's too on this list. So can a company? They have to continuous and consistently use it, even if they haven't been doing it in a little while, if they're putting it in magazine ads, trust and believe McDonald's is gonna fight for it if someone tried to come behind them to get that. It's McDonald's, come on. Okay. Um, here's another one that I didn't know belonged to this company, Open Happiness. Coca-Cola. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have never guessed you know, that. I think it's a lot easier for consumers to remember brands by their, like, I would think the polar bear, you know what I'm saying? Or that little right. whole Arctic kind of scene that they have. Those right. kind of things, I feel like the visual, I feel like the visual, when you just hear a slogan and you don't right. see with it, it's a little tough. <laughs> I think it, and it also de depends on how they're using it. Like if it goes with the song. So this one, the snack that smiles back. Goldfish. Goldfish. Exactly. <laughs> That was a good one. Now, if you don't know this Where's one, you, you probably never Where's look at rings. <laughs> How about this one? Every kiss begins with K. That's smart. That was actually very smart. K I'll, listen, K, whoever made that one from an advertising standpoint needs a raise. Yeah. They need a raise for sure. Now, it's finger licking good. I don't know. KFC. <laughs> It's it's so vague. It's so vague. Like they're not. They're. It just depends on how they're doing it. So it's okay. So obviously, easy breezy, beautiful. Cover girl. Cover girl. Here's another one. Um, eat more chicken. Chick fil A. Chick fil A. Chick fil A. The ultimate driving machine. I don't know. BMW. Okay. You're in good hands. 
All state. All state. <laughs> so the whole point of this is showing how long it takes for something to stick into your mind. You know what I mean? You have to see these things constantly and consistently. So I'm trying to get clients to understand or future clients or whoever you are that wants to work with EJ Lee Law in the future is that when you're using slogans and taglines, you want to make sure that you're consistently doing it, whether it's in an email, whether it's on your packaging, you always want to make that association with, the, with that slogan and that name so that it just bounces off of you like that. Just like with the certain ones that would say farm, cover girl, Maybelline. Maybe you know she's born with it. Say that again. You know who else is really good? Who? 1-800-411-PAIN. Oh my God. <laughs> they And I mean, they will switch it up into different raps. They probably doing a country song at some point. Uh, who knows? Yeah. yeah. But that is the whole point. We are constantly being hit with it every single time to where after mm -hmm. a while it's being. So you can't be having so many different slogans that it's hard for us to make the association between the two. And so this is why this is a big technical file. Because I have clients that'll say, I want to register the trademark for everything that comes out of my mouth. What? First of all, do you have that much money? Like, what is your budget looking like? Number two, how often are you saying these slogans and making the connection between them? Right. And what it is that you're selling to your to your audience? Does your audience have to know you for every slogan? No. <laughs> right. Think of if you go into any graphic or uh, graphic T-shirt type store like PacSun, Old Navy, they have tons of statement shirts. Right. But they're not registering every slogan that's on those shirts. Right. You're not. I, I, or I always hear people say that that should go on a shirt. That should go on a shirt. Yeah, it should go on a shirt, but it's going to be ornamental and it's not going to be known specifically to you. So that right. is the whole point of understanding this technical file and why you need to make sure that it's acting as a source identifier, which goes back to our technical file number one of what the actual purpose of a trademark is. All right, y'all. So like I said, of course, we went over and more than we planned to. <laughs> so we're going to hit you with an ad for Referee Whistle Official, the DIY trademark course coming up in May. Um, and I will leave a link in the comments so you guys can uh, see when the next course is coming up. We appreciate you guys for coming to the next episode. And on Thursday, we will be catching you guys up on what's happening in these IP streets. Um, as always, thank you for joining us. And we will see you guys on the next one. <laughs> I'm so proud. Oh my gosh, dude. That's the way to end it out. I love it. Catch you guys soon. See you later. Hello, attorney EJ Lee here. Trademarks are the first thing that people recognize about your business. However, many startups and entrepreneurs do a limited budget delay the intellectual property registration process, which often leaves them legally vulnerable. Introducing Referee Whistle Official Live Webinar, an exclusive one-day event to get you off the idea sidelines and into the game. Referee Whistle Official Live Webinar is a monthly invitation-only event for entrepreneurs, brand builders, entertainers, authors, and creatives ready to dive into the art of intellectual property protection. Are you ready to register your trademarks but unsure exactly how to do it? Our live one-day session downloads the skills and strategies necessary to identify, protect, and manage your intellectual property so that you develop a worthwhile legacy. You will receive a step-by-step -step instruction workbook, live instruction from yours truly, and time to ask questions. Sign up for the webinar now at the link or leave your email to receive upcoming webinar dates, discounts, and more. one.